If you have your Bible, will you join me in 2 Kings? Uh, we're going to be in chapter 13 this morning, and we'll conclude a series of sermons from the life of Elisha the prophet. Uh, beginning next week, we'll spend the month of November as we have the last many years as a church considering testimonies from the people of the church, testifying to God's goodness and faithfulness in their life um, that help us be grateful. Uh, we all know we're supposed to be grateful. The problem is that often we are not. Uh, so if we consider how God is acting in our lives, well, then it produces gratitude in us which is different than just telling yourself you should be grateful. Um, so we'll spend the month of November doing that, and then the Christmas season, um, we'll consider Christmas. How about that? Um, okay, so this morning, this is a message of an encouragement um, and warning about faith. Uh, the story that we'll consider at the end of Elisha's life actually serves as a warning um, that becomes an encouragement. So join me, if you would, in 2 Kings. We're going to be in chapter 13, and we'll begin the story in verse 14. We'll consider the setting first, then a warning, and then an encouragement. So 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. Now, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Here's some setting. Elisha is now an old man and he's dying. Elisha, based on the chronology of dating of kings that are mentioned in the scriptures, um, we know relatively accurately the date ranges that he lived and therefore how long he lived and how long he was a prophet um, doing ministry before the Lord. So we know for certain he was a prophet for at least 50 years and he's at least 80 years old when this happens. So in the stories we've considered in the past, Elisha is a younger man and given the kinds of things he does, we often associate that with like great even physical vigor and a sharpness of mind. Um, my guess is as we've considered stories from Elisha's life, you have not pictured him as an elderly man. He is now. We find him at the end of his life, old. I mean, old even for our reckoning, especially in the Old Testament time of the scriptures. Elisha is a really old man, and he's come to his death. Now, this begins as a warning, and I want to help you just in a few minutes understand what is happening in Second Kings and why it matters. Um, in your Bible, even if you just flip back and see the previous couple books, or swipe if you're using a screen, First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings are history books, but they're history books that are written for a specific reason. So let me lay out just super br briefly why even the book of 2 Kings is a warning. Because 2 Kings is written because it's history looking back into the history of God's activity with his people so that the people, when they receive it, they get both a warning and an encouragement. But in this case, it's mostly a warning because it doesn't go well for them. So they receive, the original recipients of 2 Kings receive it after the northern kingdom of Israel has already been turned over to their enemies. So by the time they read this, they know they've screwed up something terrible. They read this from the place of lament and regret, knowing that they screwed up. All right, so the nation of Israel, a thousand years before Jesus, is their glory time. David and Solomon, they are a united nation, a united ethnic group. They have a larger control of land that they've ever had in their history. They're powerful, they're wealthy, they're big. God told them if they obeyed him, he would do incredible and marvelous things in their life. The land that they occupy, God gave it to them as a gift. And God told them, if you are faithful to me, I will bless you beyond imagination. However, if you stiff-arm me 
and reject me, I will be patient with you over and over and over and over again. But if you insist on rejecting me, well, then I will give you what your heart desires. And then I will turn you over to your enemies. I will stop protecting you and you will be turned over to your enemies. Okay, so their glory years are really small, less than a hundred years. I mean, think of how sad that is, but that's true. Then in around in the 900s, they get divided. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. The northern kingdom retains the name Israel. It's 10 of the 12 tribes. The southern kingdom is Judah. The first king of the nation of Israel is a wicked, wretched, evil man. He leads the people away from worshiping God. He himself does not worship God. And he sets the northern kingdom on a trajectory that ends in disaster sooner than the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom meets disaster in 722. The southern kingdom, not till 150-ish years after that. Okay, here's why this matters. The book of Kings, the history book of 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings, they were all originally one really big history book. But, I mean, imagine how long that book would be. You'd probably not read it if it was that big of a volume. So the people who put the Bible's pages together said, you know what, we can put this on a smaller scroll. That would fit easier. So then now there's four volumes, all telling one big story, that God will give to his people either blessing or the consequences of if they choose to reject him or not. So the northern kingdom, bad, 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 only occasionally somewhat good, but mostly bad, 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 bad. They continue rejecting God, and then they meet their demise, their complete and utter obliteration as a people in 722 B.C. Chronicle or Samuel and Kings is written when they are already completely defeated and gone as their own ethnic. They've been carried away to the land of Assyria. So when they read 2 Kings, they're looking back into their history saying, we screwed up significantly. We should have done differently. We should have been faithful. So Kings for them is a warning. All right. So in this story, Elisha is coming to the end of his life. Now the king of Israel comes to him and he says, my father, my father, He's honoring Elisha because Elisha has proven over and over again to be the deliverer and the rescuer of people. So here is Elisha as a really old man that God is not done using. I think there's a legitimate application and an encouragement for those who are older. Um, Some in our church, by God's grace, it's wonderful to have people in our church that are in their last season of life. We live in a culture that says youth and new is better. That's often foolishness. Those who are in their last season of life, God still uses. So if you are in your last season of life, well, then you can know that God still has significant work for you to do. Or maybe some of you are caring for an elderly person. We all know what this is like. The older a person gets and their faculties are diminished, it gets increasingly difficult to believe that God still has a purpose and good work for you to do in your life. You can always encourage people who are older the ministry that they can have in prayer and encouragement. If you're an older person that can testify to God's goodness for 70 years, for 80 years, Well, then think of the powerful encouragement you can give a younger person in a simple postcard that says, trust the Lord, it is worth it. I have and he has never failed me. Okay, this is Elisha now. He's dying and he's really old. The king, Joash is his name. He comes to Elisha in a place of desperation. You can read the other chapters if you want, but this is the northern kingdom. They've rejected God. Bad, 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 bad. So their enemies are encroaching in upon them but he has some shred of faith. He comes to Elisha. I mean, we see this happening in our culture. Something terrible happens and all of a sudden everybody prays. Something terrible happens and then people on the news say things like, our thoughts and our prayers are with you. 
There's something about crisis, about deprivation, that I think helps people want to believe that somehow there is a God that is bigger, more powerful, has a plan, a purpose. Nobody wants to feel completely alone in the world. Anyway, so Joash has a little bit of faith. He musters his faith. He comes to Elijah, my father, my father. And then he uses the same phrase about Elisha that Elisha used when Elijah died. The same comment. My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. In 2 Kings chapter 2, I'll put the verses on the screen behind me. This is where we first met Elisha. Elijah says to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha says, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And Elijah says, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So now the king, who has some shred of faith, comes to Elisha, my father, my father. I don't know if this is a title he gives to Elisha or it's some exclamation of hope for deliverance, but he comes to him. And now Elisha is going to speak another promise of God's provision over him. Elisha says to him, take a bow and arrows. So the king takes a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hand. And he said, open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. All right. I think this is a really, um, a really compelling story. This is what I think happened. There's lots of possibility based on the Hebrew words and what they exactly mean. But here's, here's the picture. The king, who's in a desperate way, comes to Elisha pleading help again. And Elisha is about to remind him of God's faithfulness. He's going to make a promise to him that's going to require the king's participation. We talked about this last week. God makes promises to provide. Those who believe in him must participate by faith. There's no getting around it. If you want to experience God's provision, you have to take steps of faith. Okay, so the king comes to him, and Elisha says, get a bow and arrows. So I don't know if the king came with it or not. Tell someone to go grab him a bow and arrow. He gets it together, brings it to Elisha. Elijah says, draw the bow and arrow. Okay, so here he is standing with the bow and arrow drawn. Then Elijah places his hands on the king's hands. He's symbolically demonstrating that God is going to give him a promise. Elisha has a word from the Lord that he is now giving to this king, so he places his hands on him. Does that mean when the king, Joash, has the bow drawn, does that mean Elijah gets up out of bed and comes behind him and puts his arms on his head from behind or in the front. I don't know. Maybe he just had his bow and his quiver and Elijah stacks his hands on there. I don't know. All these are possibilities in the language. King has the bow drawn and he tells him, okay, now open the window facing east. East is the direction of their enemies. Open the window. Picture it with me now. Bow and arrow drawn. How are you going to get that window open? It's not a double-hung window, so he's not like using the tip of the arrow trying to lift up the latch. It's not a casement window where he's like, um, how's he going to get the handle spun? I don't know. Their windows are holes in the wall with a drape over it. So maybe he goes up and he nestles the curtain down the side. With the, I don't know. Somehow he says, open the window. So they pull the curtain back, the window's open. Now he tells him to shoot. Okay, now he tells him what the symbol means. The Lord's arrow, Yahweh's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek, name of a city, until you have made an end of them. This is God's promise. God is going to give you victory over your enemy. Here's the symbol of it, your arrow. Let that sucker fly. Now, this is the step of faith 
that he's going to ask the king to take. And we'll see what the king does in response. Verse 18, Elisha says, take the arrows. He took them and then he said to the king, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Strike the ground, there's lots of variation. I think it means, just like he showed him, shoot that thing out the window. That is the arrow of God's victory over your enemy. Let them fly. You ready? Yep. Okay. Start shooting. One. Two. This is the universal motion of arrow out of the quiver, right? You can see that? Arrow out of the quiver. I've seen this in the movies. And then like one motion like draws that thing back. That's pretty cool. I want to do that sometime. They make it look so easy. Out the window he goes. One. Two. Three, that ought to do it, and he stops. If I'm telling you this story and I say he just shot three arrows, isn't it obvious that he stopped? Because he shot three. The historian who's warning the people makes it clear. He shot three, and then he stopped. Bad idea. Look at how Elisha responds to him. Verse 19, then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. Now, for those of you who are looking at the text in front of you, back from verse 17 to the end of the paragraph, the word strike is in there twice, struck is in there three times, the word fight is in there once, they all sound the same in Hebrew. The whole point is that him shooting is an exercise of his faith. So God says, I will give you victory. It's pictured like the shooting of the arrow. Are you ready? Okay, well let's see your faith. One, two, three. Eh, that's probably good enough. Instead of putting all of his faith in the promise and using all the quivers, apparently he had at least five arrows in his quiver. Apparently he had five or six because Elisha says you should have shot five or six times. Now, does he reckon the enemy isn't that powerful? Does he think, well, I'm kind of losing some expensive arrows here. I think I got the point. I'll just keep the other ones. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But he gets rebuked by Elisha, and he should have shot more. I think Elijah is rebuking him, and now this is the warning. This is the warning that I think the people reading this history would have looked back, because now they're looking back at the end of Elisha's life. And who came before Elisha but Elijah? And I think the people now in exile look back, and they say, God gave us a prophet like Elijah. God gave us a prophet like Elisha. And what did we do with it? Nothing. Don't we have a tendency to imagine that if we saw more miraculous activity, if we saw God do more miraculous things in our life, then we would surely have more faith. The scriptures say otherwise. The Old Testament is full of stories, God's people seeing miracles, and it doesn't often increase their faith. Do you know the same thing happened in the time of Jesus? Jesus was an incredible miracle worker, and very few people followed him. By the time Jesus is resurrected from the dead, the book of Acts numbers the follower of Jesus in the couple of hundreds. Though he did miracles that thousands upon thousands upon thousands saw. I think that people look back with lament and regret saying we got the prophet Elijah, we got the prophet Elisha, and we didn't have enough faith to empty our quiver. I think this is a warning for us that says our participation in God's provision, in God's work, depends in part on our faith. Your faithful participation is consequential. Sometimes because we believe in the sovereignty of God and in the providence of God, I think it's easy to wrongly take an attitude that says, ah, God is going to do what God is going to do, and it doesn't really matter what I do. Yeah, that's bad thinking. Right? Your marriage 
will be what you make it. Yes, by God's grace and your faithful participation. The work that you do in your vocation, your participation by faith, it makes a substantive difference. The quality of your friendships, the quality of your relationships with your kids. Like, we know that our participation makes a difference in every area of life. Let's not be people that say, well, because God is sovereign when it comes to faith, ah, God will do what God is going to do. Yeah, I don't see the Bible drawing that conclusion. We take up obedience in the power of the Spirit that God would have us. So how easy is it for us to have a half-hearted faith, to know the promises of God, and instead of emptying everything we have for God in His work, eh, let's not get carried away. Let's not be crazy about this. A little bit of moderation will go a long way. So when it comes to a, a sinful pattern in your life, a, a character quality that is not good, isn't it easier to just sort of like manage our sin a little bit? Like I don't want it to completely get out of control, but we'll just like, we'll manage it a little bit. Instead of taking the difficult steps of faith to allow God to, to root it out deeply in your heart. I mean, these are things that, that I struggle with. Think about how easy it is to participate just in a half-hearted way in the things of God. Prayer is another one. Isn't it true that the prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman is powerful and effective? Like, prayer makes a difference. That's why when a terrible thing happens in your life, you're like, we need to pray. That's why when a cancer diagnosis comes that feels untimely, you call the people around you and you're like, will you please pray? Because we know that prayer makes a difference. But we tend to be half-hearted in prayer. The Word of God, it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul from spirit, if that were possible. Separates bone marrow from bones. And you know the marrow's in the inside of the bone, right? Somehow those get separated. The Word of God judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. That's the truth. That's what God has made known about Scripture. But isn't it easier to have a little bit of a half-hearted approach to the Bible? Yeah, if I can squeeze in a few minutes on the drive to work. I mean, listening a little bit to the Bible, that's better than nothing. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or beat you up. Just make the point that it's far easier to live with a half-hearted faith than it is to pour ourselves into God and His ways. The king of Israel should have unloaded every arrow that he had. If God is promising me victory, symbolized by this arrow, I'm shooting every arrow. And if for us as Christians today, if we believe as we do that God has given each of us gifts, talents, God chose when you would be born, to whom you would be born, at the time you would be born, the Scriptures say that God has even prepared good work in advance for you to do. The Scriptures say that one day in this world, though Jesus said in this world you will have trouble, we have overcome the world. One day Christ will return and set all things to right. In the meantime, Jesus said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Him, and then He entrusts it to all who would believe in Him to go into all the world, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize those in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and to teach people the will and the ways of God. We are not made to simply have a comfortable passive existence waiting someday for Jesus to return and do all the work. He has invited us to participate in His kingdom. Are we ever going to get to the end of our life and say, you know what, <laughs> I spent a little bit too much time in prayer? I've never heard anybody say that. I've never heard a person say, one regret that I have in my life, I was too generous with what God entrusted to me. I gave too much to people who were financially in a worse way than me. I was too generous with my talents. I was just way too helpful as a friend. Who says that? Nobody says that. God, by His Spirit, 
would have us be people who live with passion and zeal for our faith. So Paul says it this way in the book of Philippians. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. This is passion, commitment, zeal. This is metaphorically shooting every arrow that God entrusts to you. Not because you are strong, but because God is strong. God has entrusted to each one gifts, abilities, experience that we use for his purposes. And when we don't, this is the warning, when we don't, we will most certainly look back on the history of our own lives and we'll say, I could have, I could have, I should have. Why didn't I? When I did, the times in my life where I did fire all the arrows I had, God met me in those. God gave me great joy. I took steps of faith and God showed up. Nobody ever looks back on their life and says, I exercised too much faith. Way too risky of a life. Way too much faith on my part. I mean, I know God is good, but I got a little crazy there with my faith. Nobody says that. Everybody says, I'm so glad when I lived by faith. So, living by faith makes a difference. Now, here's the encouragement. The story goes on, verse 20. Elisha dies, and they buried him. That doesn't sound like very much encouragement yet. And then one of the craziest things, in my opinion, one of the craziest things recorded anywhere in the scriptures transpires. Now, bands of Moabites, that's a different enemy, used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. I'm guessing many of you didn't even know that was in the Bible. When I came back across this several weeks ago, I'm like, who just put that in the Bible? Now, when you picture burial, you picture like a shovel going six feet down in the ground. And you're picturing like what they're digging a hole partway through, and they happen to be digging it right next to Elisha's elbow bone, and so they just toss the butt. They didn't bury bodies the way that we often do. Picture the burial of Jesus often in a tomb or a cave above the ground with something blocking the entrance. So here is a group of people sometime after Elisha dies. They are burying another body when they look up on the horizon and they see an invading group coming to pillage them. And they're like, we're running out of time here, guys. We're going to have to speed this up. Now, were they like preparing a tomb that happened to be right next door to Elisha's? I don't know. Were they preparing a shelf in the tomb on which they were going to put the body that happened to be in the same one as Elisha? I don't know. Use your imagination. But they're burying this body. An enemy comes and they're like, we got to. So it says they he just cast the body in there. That doesn't mean they literally tossed it. <laughs> I don't think they did. I think it means they were in a hurry. They're like, whoa, we got, we got to finish this thing up here. Imagine their absolute shock when they're going to put the body down and it passes next to Elisha's body or they sit it next to Elisha's body and one corpse touches another corpse 
and the fresher corpse revives back to life. Now, do you think that's a story that got repeated? Yeah, that sucker was straight on Twitter, and now the world hears about what just happened. I think in the immediate context, it was a, it was a, it was a promise. It was, a, it was a, a sign that God would keep his promise to the king who had a shred of faith. Like, Elisha was dying, but he made a promise. Now Elisha's dead. Is the promise still good? I would think that king would be spurred on to greater faith if he got word that the rotting bones of Elisha gave life to someone else who died. Bigger in the Bible. This story, this real-life story, this event, would years later show up again in a prophecy from Ezekiel, who then used this same image in Ezekiel 37 of the deadness of his people. God's people, the nation of Israel, was like a whole valley of rotting bones, dry bones, that God gave a prophecy through Ezekiel because Ezekiel wrote even further into history, like closer to the present, after both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom had been completely turned over to their enemies. Ezekiel gave them a vision of one day God breathing his spirit into the dead bones of his people, reviving them and bringing them life. Jesus Christ would then come centuries later and where the prophet Elisha's dead body gave life to one Jewish person, so the dead and resurrected body of Jesus would give life to all who would trust in him and believe in him. Because the Old Testament saints, their problem wasn't that they didn't have a good enough problem. Their problem good enough prophet. Their problem wasn't that they didn't hear from the Lord enough. Their problem was the sin that dwelt in them so deeply, so perniciously, so stained were they as all human beings are by the curse of sin that produces death that they needed to be completely remade from the inside. So what Elisha could not do for God's people, Jesus did. He lived a life of perfect obedience to God that even Elisha could not do, and where Elisha could not permanently reverse the curse of death, so Jesus took on himself, becoming a curse for us, who then conquered death and lived on the other side of it, so that Jesus, all through the Gospels and here in John 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. We do well to hear the warning of God who has given every person life and breath. We do well to hear the warning that if we don't respond to him in faith, we will, by God's design, meet his justice after having received his grace and the fact that he sustained our physical lives, the fact that he's made himself known in creation through the church in his word, through your conscience. There is no one today who is apart from Jesus Christ who is ever gonna stand before God and say, I never heard, I never knew, I never saw. What is this that you're talking about, God? Like, be warned if you are not in Christ, I appeal to you. Be reconciled, be reunited to God because you didn't make yourself. And you've had moments of life, perhaps, where you had a little bit of a shred of faith, or you called upon some amount of faith from a grandparent, from a parent, from a cousin, from a time when you were little. God is gracious and patient. And in all of creation, he calls out to you to know the fulfillment of any faith in him is his son, Jesus, so that anyone who recognizes what's wrong in the world is actually the sin that dwells in them and every other creature, can find forgiveness in Jesus by trading all of who you are for all of who Christ is. And then those dry bones spiritually become alive. Those of us who already are in Christ 
we do well to hear the warning that says our lack of faith will limit our experience of God's provision. You're invited by faith to experience what God is doing. And you will never regret pouring yourself into Christ, into His ways, into His will. Because, and we end with the encouragement, because God has done something in Christ to conquer the problem of sin and death and to give life to all who would desire to have it so that we can increasingly in this life grow to become more like Jesus, participate all the more by faith in the plan and the purposes that he has for us. Will you let me pray for us and then we'll close our service in song. Uh, Father, for those this morning who have attempted to live a life outside of Christ, God, I pray that they would hear the gentleness and the clarity of your warning. God, would they place faith in you and not themselves. And God, for those of us in Christ, Father, help us by your spirit to be passionate about you, passionate about the ways that we can know you, passionate about the ways that we can be a part of sharing the truth that you are good and loving and kind, that you have made a way for all to be reunited to you. Father, thank you that you have given us a spirit, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit that gives life. Thank you that he dwells within us spurring us on higher up and deeper into the things of God. Father, have your way in us, we pray. In the name of our Savior, Jesus, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.